So, been following IGN for a long time, reported on a lot of stuff that you guys reported on first. One thing that, that I find really interesting because I'm on the outside looking in, like I used to be editor in chief of like a bigger Zelda website and then now I'm a YouTuber. Um, one thing that happens every time IGN gets brought up as a source on something is I see a lot of reactions saying that mm, you can't trust IGN. You know, you, 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 you can't trust them. They, they, they have ads. I'm like, you know, YouTubers, you can trust them. They have ads, but they don't control their ads. IGN controls their ads. They know who they're working with or they know that, you know, they've done things to, 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 I guess, I'll, you know, I, I, I understand how the process works. I think I actually talked to uh, someone, someone on your team a long time ago when some accusations came up because I made a report on it and then they, they clarified. It was actually really, I was, I was shocked mm-hmm. honestly, that IGN reached out and said, Hey, we want to correct the record and let you know how, how, the, how that works. So I understand how everything works and why I know that, this stuff doesn't affect the reporting, but I think on the outside looking in, you know, people come in and say they don't have ad block on and they see like a giant call of duty ad taking up the whole yeah. website. They're like, well, how can you trust what they're saying about call of duty? Yeah. So, you know, for the sake of people who don't know, <laughs> now I do know, I haven't talked about it since then. Um, how do you like feel about how, how fans react to that kind of stuff? Cause I think it's understandable that they react that way. Cause they obviously don't. Oh, yeah. But I mean, look, vig- vigilance is, is important, right? And we see reports about campaign donations and politics every day. And like the reason why people donate to politicians is to influence them, right? And to get something done. And so if you apply that and say, well, maybe Activision is spending more on IGN because they want to influence, then I, I think it's smart to be vigilant and as a consumer be aware of, uh, of you know, uh, of kind of like the ad model. That said, um, you know, when it comes to IGN and YouTubers, and this is, this is absolutely not to say that a YouTuber is necessarily more susceptible to be influenced by ads, but like as a, as a company, um, if, if, a de- if a developer doesn't send us a game, our reviewer doesn't care because our reviewer doesn't pay for it, right? We'll buy the game for the reviewer and send it to them. Honestly, it's a process that is completely opaque to the reviewer. They don't necessarily know if they got a free code or if everybody got a free code of, or if IGN paid for it and blah, 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 right? And so there's a system in place that uh, makes it so that the reviewer itself is isolated from the whole kind of procurement process. We also don't let the publisher talk to the reviewers. Um, you know, like when we have freelancers, we don't, we don't create this sort of direct connection where there's any sort of influence. Secondly, the reviewer is paid a flat fee. When they work at IGN, they're paid in a salary. When they're freelancer, they're paid for, you know, the amount of time that it takes to create the review. If the review tanks, the reviewer gets the same amount of money. If the review is a giant hit, gets millions of views, the reviewer gets the same amount of money. With a YouTuber, it's different, right? Mm -hmm. If as a YouTuber, you create a review that's a hit, um, you get more money, you run more ads, right? And so there is, that's not to say that a YouTuber would purposely create something that is either so positive that they get amplified by the publisher or so negative that everybody jumps on it and freaks out and, and gives them views. But like there is that door and the, the way that the audience needs to deal with it is to get to know the reviewer and get to know the YouTuber. Are there any indicators that that person can't be trusted and is not grounded? And I think People don't always apply that to a company because the company is many faces, right? And it's not like sometimes you've never seen the reviewer before you see in a YouTube video because they're new. And so can you trust them? I think if you look at IGN and you look at how we covered games over the years, pretty much every major game company advertises on IGN. If really it was a system where an advertiser could buy favors and more positive reviews, every game would get a positive review. But if you look at our history, you can do a screen cap of the IGN homepage on the launch of a game and you might see an ad for that game, but you might also see on that same page a review scoring that game a four out of 10, right? And so I'm hoping that people see that and see the experience like Call of Duty, I'm sure they advertise, I actually, don't remember uh, i'm sure they advertised this year but the campaign got a six right um on on ign people always think we give every call of duty game a 10 we have never given a call of duty game a 10. um and so I, I i think the proof is there 
But then just to explain, and it's sorry if this answer is a little long, um, but just to explain how we're set up. So there's an editorial team. I oversee the content team. So the people on my team, editorial, video, create articles, they produce the videos, they amplify them, they post to social media and all of that. There's a separate sales team under a different person, Kim, Kim uh, Lee Hatfield, who runs this department. All the these are the sellers who work with the publishers to place the ads. Um, there is a branded department that may create like, you know, specific kind of branded solutions, you know, sponsored videos that you see on YouTube channels as well. IGN has sponsored videos. When that team creates those videos, they're clearly labeled. It says sponsored by, it has disclosures. It's not editorial content. Editorial is not on the hook to, to promote it or anything. You know, it's not like there's some sort of model where editorial now has to say, we love this game because there's a sponsored piece that, you know, talks about, uh, has like interviews or behind the scenes or something. So the whole process is separate. We call it the separation of church and state. We don't know who's church or state because, you know, I guess editorial preaches the gospel. And, but, you know, at the same time, we also make the laws around the content. So we could be either one, but the processes are run separately. It has happened that a publisher gets pissed at IGN. Uh, the most famous companies to get pissed off at IGN were always uh, Acclaim, THQ, old school Activision for sure. You know, there are many more. When we gave a game a, a bad score, they would huff and puff. Um, maybe their PR person would go to the editorial team and, and kind of voice their dis discontent. But the marketing people would definitely go to the sales team and they would say, hey, we're going to pull our ads. And the sales team would not share this information with editorial. And so sometimes game publishers pulled ads. This happened at our sister company, Rotten Tomatoes all the time. When the score was not fresh, the movie studios would pull the ads. Since they're an aggregator, it doesn't matter. It's nothing they can do. But like at IGN, I'm sure some of them try to influence us, but we just never pass that information to the editorial team, you know? And so mission incomplete, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> There's like a wall of separation. So even if a person wanted to pay to influence a game, the person writing the review wouldn't even know about it. Yeah, and as someone who's covered games, I've never had any... PR person actively trying to influence a review through some sort of promise of like monetary gain or anything like that. It's just never happened. The only, the only thing uh, I think it was um, oh, EA did uh, Dante's Inferno. The PR team did this stunt where they sent people a hundred bucks or something. And like and and like, but they want and they call they tied it in with the vices in the game or something. What they wanted to happen is everybody complain about it, journalists being angry. And I remember somebody like somebody posted a video of them burning the check or something, um, which is like you fell into the trap. You actually are, you know, you, you, you gave the game a mention because of this obnoxious campaign. Um, that was the only thing. And they clearly designed it as a stunt. Um, all the other like I've never had anybody try to influence directly influence content. That said, PR people are paid to make you think that game is great. When you have a great relationship with a PR person, they will tell you when a game is crap, but most of the time they'll obviously try to make you see the great in the game and, you know, like more power to them. And if you run a good editorial team and you have a smart reviews editor, they put the sort of kind of barriers and processes in place to make sure that, you know, those external pressures don't influence the reviewers. I would actually say, the audience puts more pressure on reviewers than the actual companies ever did or ever do. Yep. Seven out of 10, too much water. Hey, we get this all the time, right? Like people saying you give every game a seven. It's like, no. Okay. Look at the reviews index out of the last 30 reviews, four got sevens, right? Like it's not true, but it becomes this meme. Um, but also that I think one of the challenges is that we self-select now. We can't review every game. So we're not going to review review the bargain bin stuff. There, I mean, as we're speaking, another 20 games have released on Steam, probably 50 on mobile, right? There, there's a constant stream of games and you have to pick and choose not just what is good and has potential, but what is of interest to the audience. And so... Mm -hmm. I remember during the Wii age, we tried to review everything that came out. We eventually gave up. And so you get a lot of reviews that are twos and threes because there's so much crap on that platform. We can't do that today because we also have to make a video review and all of that, right? Like we would only be able to review 10 games a month. Yeah. A lot of that, a lot of that's kind of like my process with 
uh, news coverage because I do a lot of uh, Nintendo news stuff. I really got to pick and choose what I'm going to put up because I, it, I'm not going to cover everything. Like it's just no, you got to figure out what the audience wants. It's a, I mean, it's a bummer, right? Like I am, I'm the world's greatest pick cross fan as, as you, I'm sure you know. Um, I have I've heard it mentioned a few game. times on some of your podcasts. Yeah. It's, it's become a bit of a joke. It's like, honestly, I couldn't even finish the last pick cross be, be, before the new one came out because like, if you want to do everything, they're over a hundred hours you have to put into these games and the games are all the same, right? Like they don't evolve much. So it, it's, it's becoming funny, but it's like, I, like a review won't do anything. Like if even if even if it's a wonderful Picross game, reviewing it it'll get five thousand views on YouTube, even on our giant channel. And it's like so, it's not worth for us to take the time. But it's a bummer. So I'm I'm trying to figure out. Like we introduced a user review scoring concept into IGN last week quietly. We don't want it to get review bombed. We're trying to build something that is a little bit more fortified to the. I'm the angry. Your game doesn't have X, and so they they. Kind That's of my problem, problem with a lot of review. Uh, yeah. A lot of user reviews everywhere. It's review bomb city. You never really know what to believe. I, I saw in response, by the way. That's really funny. I saw in response to our Call of Duty campaign review, which now. No, for a change, people were mad that it was too low. Usually people are always mad that the score is too high. Mm-hmm. But like there, a, a user said in response, you know, you can't trust critics anyway. You know, I go by user reviews. And I'm like, go to Metacritic, man. It's like at a 3.8 or something because <laughs> the users are mad about a game they haven't played yet, right? And like, mm-hmm. it, I think the right thing to do is trust people you know get to know a reviewer. We've added more and more um, indicators into our reviews to help you learn about the reviewer. With Playlist, we now have little breakouts that tell you the user, the reviewer's favorite games. Like, you know, like uh, in in the um, High on Life, it's a recent review. High on Life review has a playlist in it that are Travis's favorite funny games, right? And so you're, we're trying to teach the audience who the reviewers are so that they don't just see the big IGN score. Um, and it's the same with YouTubers, and I would say it's the same with users. Like a user aggregate score is not that meaningful. You have no idea if those people played the game. You have no idea what games they like. Do they love, you know, chasing down hidden stuff? Do they hate repetition? They might be completely different from you. And so I think the systems on the, of the future are more find people you trust, find people you like, find people you align with, and then take their viewpoint as guidance read and watch what's what's being said and make a decision based on that it's not about agreeing with everybody there's no way like to to get to that you mean i can't oh i was gonna say you mean i can't be my purchasing decisions on uh every nintendo published game on wii u having four and a half stars on their eShop? <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing right like <laughs> game. <laughs> it's it's you, you know the the, the sort of um, what the motivation for submitting a score, either you're super pissed off or you love something. Mm-hmm. So what, what I'm trying to do with playlists and people, you know, it's still a very small tool with a small audience. What I'm trying to do with playlists is create a funnel where an audience says, I'm playing this game. And when they say, I completed this game, we ask, oh, what did you think, right? And so we're trying to build this more natural funnel instead of putting a review slider next to the IGN score on a review, which would get maximum user reviews, put it in a process where you can be more reasonably sure that the user actually played the game. Steam's great at that. Steam has a filter where it's only people who actually played the game, right? That sort of stuff's awesome. I want to say that's why I like listening to podcasts, especially with uh, NVC and GameScoop whenever they cover uh, some of the games I like, because they're more generalized covering all kinds of systems. Um, You get an actual conversation between different people. One may like something in a game, the other person may not like it. Someone might just think, eh, but you get to hear the full conversation and back and forth on why it's good and why it's bad, not just one person's opinion and a star rating or something. But my final question about the, on the IGN side of stuff before we move on to Zelda is when it comes to your relationship with different, or not just yours, but IGNs in general, relationship with these different companies, and you've had people from IGN that's moved on to work for Nintendo or Microsoft and all these places, and I'm sure they keep their same relationship. So whenever it comes to maintaining that relationship, but at the same time, a big piece of news ends up leaking. 
whether it's screenshots or gameplay or uh, like Grand Theft Auto 6 had that big leak a while back. Um, there's some slips that some of the voice actors of Tears of the Kingdom made. I think it was the Latin voice actor had mentioned that he had finished, or maybe it was a Spanish voice actor, that they had finished audio or that they were working on it or something, or that one of the Daruk's great ancestor or something, which it was in the game, which implies that maybe there's a cutscene that shows what happened hundreds or thousands of years ago or something like that but you can kind of piece together what to expect based off of these leaks so how do you go about covering those when it might be something that if it's a game that you're working on that's in the process of being reviewed and you all all already know this or at least the person reviewing the game ahead of time already knows all of this but you can't say anything because of your nda how do you go about covering something that leaks while you're actively reviewing the game? Is it something that you just avoid, or do you still cover it? But no, we we, we cover else? it. So as as a as a company, obviously we are we are a little bit more vulnerable than an individual, right? Like Nintendo is unlikely to go after Nate and sue him, um, but like a, a a bigger company or an outlet, like if we if we posted screenshots and videos from a hack or a leak like that, we'd definitely be in trouble, right? So we have to be careful. Um, But we can report on information as it is editorially relevant um, uh, from leaks if we trust the sources or we have a direct source, and and we would. Um, There's so much false stuff out there. Obviously, you got to be very, very careful. And sometimes, you know, you might have three sources telling you the same thing, but like they all informed each other. And in the end, it's a bunch of hot air. So you you have to be careful. Um, No, we we cover it. Um, Companies sometimes get pissed off for covering leaks, right? The, the, The annual Assassin's Creed leak, I can tell you, Ubisoft's never happy. Um, you know, they would like that to be a surprise, I'm sure. Um, when it comes to an NDA, uh, I don't know if you saw a Pokemon review. We actually posted it late. And the embargo, um, so an embargo for those people who don't know, like, in order to get advanced access of some games, companies ask you to agree to an embargo. That embargo uh, is it, a contract. It says you cannot uh, write about, uh, you cannot show footage of this game until date X, which is public release. Um, they, they sometimes stipulate something like don't spoil the ending, which we wouldn't, um, th- that, that sort of stuff. Companies have tried where they send you an NDA, an embargo, and they say, and you can post your stuff a day after the game comes out. And we're like, absolutely not. We're not going to sign that, right? Like the moment the game is publicly available, we need to be able to go live. And in some cases, games have shipped early and we went back to the publisher said, your NDA says, tomorrow but the game is out now um can we can we adjust the date if they say no we might actually say okay we're going to assign a new reviewer and they're going to play the publicly available copy with pokemon what happened is there the nda was restrictive in weird ways where we decide we're going to wait and it was because sometimes you get an nda where the publisher says you can only use footage we provide you and that is Mm -hmm. sometimes it's because they they um they have a patched version that they haven't submitted yet. And so they fix some visual bugs. So it, it might be innocuous and they want you to use footage that is representative of the final game. But like in some cases, you know, if that means we cannot, we're playing a game and it's buggy and it has issues and all the footage that they provide doesn't let us show us, we'd probably bow out and say, no, thank you. Um, in some cases, you know, like, Remember, remember Cyberpunk? We got access to the good versions ahead of time, posted our review, and then the, we, we noted, hey, we didn't get access to the last gen ones. We're a little worried about these. The moment they came out, we quickly booted up and made videos of them, and we said, okay, we're going to do a separate review for these because they don't run the same. But it's like that's where you see kind of like embargoes being can be an issue, right, because they can influence the narrative. If everybody thinks, oh, all the versions are the same, and they look at our positive review, they could be misled. So it's a tricky situation. Um, but basically, as, a, as an editorial outlet, you have a choice, right? You can say, if the embargo uh, stipulations are too strict, we can just have a late review and buy the game when it comes out. And we've done that many, of t- many times. 
Or if an embargo ever has a clause in it saying you can't say anything negative, then we would never sign it. And we have, honestly, I think we've had some one embargo specify you can't show bugs. And we're like, nope, no deal. Like, if your game has bugs, we're going to show bugs. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. I would love to go on and continue talking about a bunch of behind the scenes IG and stuff. Um, that's usually what I'm most interested in is stuff that goes on in the background. But Tears of the Kingdom finally has a release date for next. Well, I don't think an exact release date, but it's coming May out 12? within the next May 12th, is it? Yeah, so it is an exact release date. Release date. Oh, okay. they, oh, don't you do that to me. They didn't renege that, that release date. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's not a date, right? It's a it's a release zone. Well, they said they said May twelfth when they yeah, that last trailer. Well, did they? It's actually yeah. May twelfth. Actually, May twelfth. Yep. Okay. So All going right. going from breaking news, May twelfth. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> okay. You heard it here first. No. <laughs> so with Breath of the Wild, uh, what what were your generalized thoughts on that game? Of course, they added so many different new features to it. Uh, what were your generalized thoughts on it? If you can give generalized thoughts on Breath of the Wild, as oh big of a game as it is, and then how do you see them bringing even more new gameplay mechanics to Tears of the Kingdom, or do you think it'll be, instead of bringing back, uh, or bringing in new features, do you think it'll be instead bringing back some of the old features that fans had asked for and making like a mix of what we had in Breath of the Wild and the traditional, or do you think it'll just be more new stuff? And where do you see it going? All right, Jesse, obviously, Breath of the Wild is my favorite game of all time. So I'm a, I'm a huge Zelda nut. I have played every game in the series, um, including, you know, Satellaview stuff and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, very, I'm super excited about the sequel. Breath of the Wild, and, and I, I am a, a big fan of the classic setup of kind of, you know, call it more Link to the Past style, like, more forgiving overworld with tricky dungeons that you can do even if it's if it's in order i'm fine with it i love that sort of setup and so breath of the wild is obviously very different and i found it so utterly brilliant that they were able to take the series and give you an experience that was much more it made you feel like you were the only person to experience the game that way. And like for the longest time I'd come to work and somebody would say, Oh my God, I threw a sword and the lightning bolt hit it right in the air. And all the book goblins get blown up, right? Like everybody has these stories where they feel like only they experience them. And I, I feel like that was a, an amazing thing. And I forgave the game for not having these amazing puzzle dungeons with kind of, you know, water, fire, earth kind of variety of, of setups that, you know, the beasts were great, but they all looked the same. And like, in my mind, I thought the ideal game would be if it had this sort of established game system where cold matters, electricity matters, heat matters, rain matters. Like, I love that, like the, where the environment becomes part of the story and the challenge and then still have this sort of uh, this sort of system where a tool matters. I love finding a hook shot and going, you know, screw everyone, I can get to everything now, right? Like, or getting a, a, a boomerang where the boomerang is meaningful because it has this sort of puzzle solution ability, whereas like in, in Breath of the Wild, it was just a weapon, right? Um, so my hopes are that we get everything that made Breath of the Wild so open and free and wonderful with a little bit of a through line of the sort of Metroid-y, Zelda-y kind of item gate stuff where it's like there are certain things you can't do until you discover an item. Um, I would love to see that. And then as far as, you know, can it live up to the first one, this is going to be a tough one because like it's, it could be like Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, where visually Majora's Mask didn't knock us off our socks, right? When it came out, honestly, when it first came out, it looked worse than Ocarina of Time. Like there were some hideous textures and areas in Majora's Mask, but that game dazzled us with a new structure. It used a playground that seemed familiar and then mixed it up with this time travel style and it was really fresh. And so... That's my other hope is that there's something in the sequel. Maybe it is time travel. Maybe it's how it ties into other games in the series that dazzles us and is really unique. Um, Nate, uh, we have about five minutes left. Do you have any final things that you would like to ask or anything Zelda related or? Well, to keep it on the Zelda theme, put you on the spot. What's your top five Zelda games? <laughs> 
top five Zelda games. Oh man, do I have them organized? Let me Someone's look at off camera holding a weapon to his head. <laughs> Let me look at IGN playlist. <laughs> I don't answer the, I don't ask that question. So, I, and honestly, I've, I've I've changed my mind over the years many times. Like sometimes I said Ocarina of Time was my favorite game. Then I would renege and say Link to the Past is my my favorite game. Those are always up there. It's definitely number one is, is Breath of the Wild. Now, I'd put number two. I would probably put Ocarina of Time. Number three, Link to the Past. Number four, Wind Waker. Number five, what do I have? You know, would I would I put maybe Link Between Worlds? It's between Link Between Worlds and Majora's Mask, I think. And that's not to say I don't love Twilight Princess. A lot of people loved it when it came out and are more negative on it because you know, it is a little bloated um, and like it's not as well engineered. Like you get a re really powerful item late in the game and then don't don't get to use it that much. Um, but I really love Twilight Princess and, and some of those games too. And like, I'd say my least favorite ones are the, the touchscreen adventures. I, as much as I think they were the right thing to do on the DS, I really love that sort of feel of being in control and like Zelda games have this, like when you do combat, it just feels right. And it's because of how they drop frames and like where they pause in a sword slash that really makes it feel awesome. And I think it probably hasn't gotten as good as Wind Waker ever again. Awesome. That was, that was the Zelda question I had anyways. Yeah. But what I mean, there's so many great games in the series. It's it's kind of tough to pick, pick five favorites. But I think those are those are it. If you can answer this in a quick sentence, where do you expect the Zelda series to go after Tears of the Kingdom? Do you think they'll keep with this art style, or do you think they'll try something new and creative again? Uh, it, I mean, I I would love it if they did another cell shaded wind waker style game i would absolutely adore that i think they got a little bit you know i i think they shied away from it a little bit more um because of the initial negative reaction but that game has just increased in value and and appreciation over the years i would really love if they did something i mean they, they could do uh they, they could make a game that looks like an anime i think and i think people would absolutely love it um but I, I, I honestly think that the pivot to Breath of the Wild was so big and it took so much experimentation. I think we will probably get this style of adventure for a little longer. I think the next couple of Zelda games will be more like these two. And then we'll see if they, uh, if they revisit it. But hey, we got Link's Awakening. That looked different from any Zelda game. Probably closest to Link to the past, right? Um, so maybe the, the, they'll experiment a little bit. All right. Well, Per, thank you so much for joining and spending uh, your time with us. I know I've asked a few times and wasn't able to make it happen uh, in the past, but I'm so glad that I was finally able to this yeah. time and have you on for a second time. Nate, thank you for joining me, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Awesome. Thanks right. for having me. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you all so much for watching the video, and please, if you made it this far, consider subscribing and commenting below. It really does help us out. Hello everyone, I just want to say thank you for watching the video all the way through. Some of you have been asking, and yes, we still have shirts and other merch available at teespring.com. You can find a link in the description below. If you purchase one and send us a picture wearing it, we will give you a shout out and include your picture during one of our upcoming videos. Thank you to our amazing Patreon supporters, starting off with our royal family, Shadow to Us. On our champion tier, Justin Clark, Monica Spath, Sober X, In the Sheikatir, Andre Moy, Joseph, Natsu, Wrecker One, Rusty Caulfield, Tremel, and In the Kukiri Tier, Gene Pinna, Chad Costin, David Guthman, Candy, Disappointment, Gus Calvo, Zane, Lean, Lovable Christy, Mr. Monocled Metroid, and whoever this is only donated to hear Jesse speak my name. Thank you all so, so much. If any of you would like your name to be featured at the end of any of our videos or to get a shout out at the beginning of our Zelda podcast, the Hylian Gamescast, and to have any of your topics or questions answered or turned into a full video to be featured here on our channel, along with many other things, please 
join our Patreon and help support the channel. Thank you all so much. Happy Halloween.